Okay, so Rings of Power Episode 6 is now here, and the entry is filled with easter eggs, hidden details, and a big ending that we're going to be breaking down in this video. The show has been very hit and miss, but just when I think it couldn't get any dumber, you come back and completely redeem yourself. Does it save the series for us? We'll get into it, but I definitely feel like this is a big step in the right direction, though it does play fast and loose with a lot of the canon. This is easily the most focused episode so far, with us just getting the Arondir and Galadriel storylines instead of all the other side characters, like Kemen. I don't bloody care, man. Anyway, crap puns aside, the entry ends with the creation of Mount Doom. This is something we've been speculating would happen, and it's very much a Pompeii-level event for the people of Middle-earth. Adar has wanted to create a way for the orcs to be able to thrive during the day, and last week he talked about how he wanted to destroy the sun. The mountain will blanket the clouds with ash and make it a land of eternal darkness so that the orcs can move about whenever they like. As discussed in the original trilogy, the very air you breathe there is poisonous due to the ash and I think everyone is going to have to leave because it's completely lost. Waldrig ends up fully forming the blade and next to the shrine of Sauron he twists the key to release water which then travels through the trenches into the lava beneath the mountain. It was nice seeing the plan all come together and this will of course give Sauron a way to create the One Ring. This is very much in opposite to the Forge, which we know is being built by Celebrimbor and the Elves. I'm guessing that the finale will have a scene in which Sauron creates the Ring, and on the opposite side of this, we will see as Celebrimbor starts to create the others. It's been said throughout the season that Adar's plan is to give the Orcs a home for them to live in, and he finally accomplishes this, m making him the good guy, I guess? Now, he gives a really rousing speech in the opening, in which he calls them all brothers and sisters that have had to endure the daylight. Brought a tear to my eye, and you know what, I was like, yeah, f*** him up, f*** him up. You could say I adore him. If you put a bit of a Leslie Phillips on that, it works. Hello. <laughs> now this ending is foreshadowed in the opening shot of the entry with Adar running his hands through the dirt and he says new life in defiance of death. He plants some seeds and Arondia later gives some to Bronwyn, which we learn is an elvish tradition that they carry out before a battle. In the end, this land will very much belong to Sauron, and Mount Doom secures that this will no longer be where men feel free to tread. In the books, the mountain actually responded to his presence, and after his defeat, it lay dormant until the ring started to make its way back. Upon his defeat, the volcano erupted violently once more, and it happening here shows that the heroes have already lost. When the waves come crashing down, I also wondered if this might have a ripple effect in which the oceans flood Numenor, I think we're too early in the timeline for that to be happening. The episode has a lot of action in it, and because of this, there's not that much stuff to break down easter eggs wise, but we will be going through it all. If you enjoy the video, please hit the thumbs up button, and also don't forget to subscribe for videos like this every day. Without the way, huge thank you for clicking this, now let's get into Rings of Power. Now after the opening monologue that would make William Wallace head off, we watch as the orcs storm the tower. I got a lot of Helm's Deep vibes here, with the design of the area looking similar to the offshoots of the location. They even have a pathway up, and the orcs carry a battering ram similar to that movie. As predicted, Arondir ends up using the tower to kill them, and it brings down the entire structure on them whilst my man busts out some kung fu to lock them inside. Bronwyn returns to the village with the people, and because of this early attack, Adar ends up using decoys in order to spare his orcs. He swarms the village with men in orc uniforms, and they realise that they've been forced to fight amongst themselves in order to whittle down their numbers. Had they worked together, they probably could have defeated the orcs, but divided they fall. I've always thought that Tolkien originally wanted to show that people from all walks of life can work together to defeat evil, and this is why Lord of the Rings was very much about the elves, dwarves, men and hobbits coming together as one. It's only once the new Minorians arrive that things finally start to feel like they're on the up and up, and we cut to them making their voyage across the sea. A seal dog gets up to sweep the stables, and he ends up eating an apple. Typically in fiction, apples are supposed to represent knowledge and wisdom, but a seal door ends up throwing this into the sea. Might be reaching, but it could be symbolising his lack of it, which is then filled in by everyone's favourite character Galadriel. She talks about using her elvish eyes to see the shoreline, and this is something that we've seen Legolas and Elrond doing. Isildur has been punished to sweep the stables, and this lack of power could be why he holds onto the ring so tightly. He says that he wanted to escape Numenor because the true Numenor, true Menor, no longer exists, however Galadriel says that he carries it within him. His father would of course go on to become the king, and Isildur would carry the blood of the Numenorians in him, which would be passed on to Aragorn. 
His mother is brought up several times in this episode, and there are theories that she might be the voice that he constantly keeps hearing. I actually think that it's more likely Sauron, or a dark force masquerading as her, in order to manipulate the character. We learn that she drowned, and the source material itself doesn't really touch upon her. On Muriel's map, we watch as she outlines the plan, and I believe this text is written in Numenorian Sindarin, which was their language. Captain obvious there, but I don't know how they know a big attack is coming in the village, but as soon as they hit the coast, they just go mental and start pegging it out there. Maybe if you hadn't sat around for 10 days preparing, you wouldn't have to do this, but never mind. Now we cut to Arondir trying to destroy the blade, but he fails to do it. This is obviously meant to be similar to the ring, and how Gimli tried to break it at the Fellowship Council. He goes to hide it, but hey, you he, he could have picked somewhere better, mate. Bit crap, but moving on. Now my guess is that it will be dropped into Mount Doom, but Theo ends up spying on him. They prepare for the fight in the daylight, Arondir promises to become Theo's new stepdad, and whether that's going to happen or not remains to be seen. The sun set in the battle brings a new meaning to the phrase eye for an eye, and all in all, I did really enjoy this scene. After six hours of plotting and exposition, it felt nice to get something where it felt there were real stakes to it. And I know and I know everyone's going to be like, you only like action, you, you're so stupid. But it is nice once in a while, just to break things up, you know, add some dynamics. Now it's gory, filled with Home Alone traps, and it has a great one-shot take in it. When the trick is revealed, the orcs fire from the trees, and they hit Bronwyn before they storm the tavern. Jed Brophy also returns as an orc, which we get confirmed by the credits, and not only has he played one and died in this series, but he's also an actor that's appeared as one in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He also played Nori the Dwarf in Peter Jackson's Hobbit films, and I hope we get him back every single episode. It's great to see him constantly popping up, and hide your wife, hide your kids, because the orcs cut through them to make a point, and it's all in service of getting the blade. Theo gives it to save his mother, and reveals it's hidden under a slab. I thought, I thought you said no one would ever find it, you f***ing idiot. Though whilst all this is going on, we watch the cavalry rolling in with Galadriel, and it's moments like this where you realise why this is the most expensive show ever made. They storm the village, and it reminded me a lot of the cavalry descending on Helm's Deep in the Two Towers. Obviously, Amazon have purposely pulled from the Jackson movies as much as possible, because they know that's what general audiences relate to the most. I'll probably get a lot of dislikes for saying I enjoyed this scene, but I thought the horse stunt work was really well put together, especially with Galadriel swinging around on hers whilst beheading orcs. Elendil is saved by Halbrand whilst the sealed door rushes to his side, and something similar would happen with him going to his father after he's struck down by Sauron. Adar is captured, and we discover that he was one of the elves used to create the very first orcs. Adar translates to father, and he sees himself very much as one to the race. The Book of Lost Tales detail that Morgoth bred them from the heats and slimes of the earth, However, this has been pretty much cast to the side, with even Tolkien himself clearly stating that Morgoth couldn't create life. During the first years of the Lambs, it's said that the elves were kidnapped and tortured, till they became the very first orcs. Adar says that he killed Sauron, but we know that can't be the case because of what comes next in the timeline. I was speaking with our editor Matt about this, and he was questioning whether Adar is Sauron now, and similar to Highlander, it's like killing Sauron makes you become Sauron. It would the fans off so much if this was the case, and you the name father and stuff, I think it's more just along the lines of exactly how it's presented. Hearing the name Sauron has triggered him before, and instead, I think he views himself as carrying his message rather than actually becoming him. Sauron is likely in the Unseen World currently, which once more gets name dropped. We discovered in episode 1 that the orcs were experimenting with a way to access this, and get flashes of it in Adar's monologue. He tortured orcs trying to access it, I think we also see some stone carvings of what looks like a Balrog's head. Adar was complicit in killing what he refers to as children, all in the sacrifice of Sauron's goals. He says that he killed him for this, but again, I don't think it's true. And that kind of takes us in a theory time. So Halbrand clearly knows Adar, and he almost kills him out in the woods. Upon going to exit the barn, Adar asks him who he is, but he refuses to answer. I know the most popular theory at the moment is that he's Sauron, and if a dark killed the Dark Lord, then it makes sense that he'd have this vendetta against him. He has whispered in Farazon's ear, similar to what Sauron did, and one of his first lines was about how appearances can be deceptive. Now this might be the case with him masquerading as the king, because it's clear no one knows who he is. The theories that he's Theo's father are out the window, and he could just be a thief who took the sigil, or perhaps even the Dark Lord himself. 
In the book, Sauron appeared as Anatol, aka the Lord of Gifts, and under this guise, he pretended to be a positive figure. Could very much be the case here, though I am still second guessing this, but anyway, that's in a few times. I don't really think he's Sauron, but I thought I'd just discuss it in a few times. He's probably just a normal guy, probably a nice guy, seems alright. Now, it is that Morgoth's success has become her mirror. I think this is just the scriptwriters trying to do a play on Galadriel's mirror, which I, I don't know if it lands. Anyway, we get a huge hunt completely on when we discover that Halbrand definitely isn't Theo's father. Muriel introduces him to lead them, but the guy isn't someone I don't think people want in charge. He's a thief, scoundrel, and seems like he's been slotted into being in charge without an actual vote, which could lead to him crashing the economy, but we won't get into that. Now, Rondia gives the bait back to Theo and tells him to find a way to toss it into the sea, but he realises it's been one big bait and switch, and that it's a tool just like he is. Elendil gives some words to his father about becoming one with a horse, and I knew, I knew a horse once that had white kids, so but never mind. Now, we end with a mountain being created, and the land being blanketed in the Ash of Doom after Waldrick starts the fire up. That ends the episode, and I'm sure you can tell from the breakdown that I enjoyed this entry way more than what's come before. There wasn't really any messing around, and I think just having a clear focus on a select group of characters really, really helped. Rather than jumping back and forth between characters dropping exposition, we saw as we got to follow a small group as they fought through the highs and lows of Middle Earth. Now, obviously, you do need setup, but I think the series has spent way too much time in that mode, so it's nice to finally get some payoff. Happy to say it didn't disappoint, and it sets up a lot of things for next time. I'm guessing that we'll of course see the orc uprising as the men try and survive the landscape being changed, but beyond that, they can tie several things into it. The Hobbits are of course pushing their caravan, and I think they'll see the eruption and potentially be caught in it. Last episode we watched as they crossed what I believe are the Dead Marshes, so there is potential that they're in the area. If we can also get the fall of Numenor, I think that would be big too, so yeah, lots of things to look forward to in the next two episodes. Hopefully it steers the ship back on track, and you know, if they end on a high note, uh, I think I'll be a lot more forgiving of what's come before. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so make sure you comment below and let me know. We are in a competition right now and giving away three copies of Thor Love and Thunder on the 15th of October, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our rating of She-Hulk, or, or maybe not. Maybe go watch House of the Dragon, which will be linked on screen right now. By the way, thanks for seeing through the video. I've been Paul. I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.